Hello, I am Macoculus, and in this world there are many different groups of people trying to snuff out the light of modern civilization and send us back to the Dark Ages. These people do so with various motives such as money, power, or fear of having their feelings hurt. And these people need to be brought to task. We're going to start off with a four-part series to address a creationist. All right, well, <laughs> this is a great turnout. Wonderful. Great. Well, it's my pleasure to come before you this evening and talk about how science confirms biblical creation because we live in an age where the Bible has been attacked and ridiculed. The Bible isn't being ridiculed. It's a fascinating piece of literature that was written by primitive people who didn't know better and offers us a window into their minds. What is being ridiculed are the people like you who believe it is the inerrant word of God even though it has been demonstrated to be wrong and immoral many times. Well, particularly in the book of Genesis, right? That's the book where people say, well, you can't trust the Bible anymore because we know millions of years of evolution. That's the way that, that life arrived on this planet and so on. Well, that's what people say. Two things. One, evolution says nothing about how life got on this planet. It only deals with life after it was already here. And two, it's not what people say, it's what the evidence shows. Just because your side relies entirely on personal testimony doesn't mean ours does. And, you know, it's really important for every Christian to be able to, to give a defense of the faith. And one of the ways in which we can be, at least begin conversations is by knowing a little bit about the science behind origins. And so uh, that's what I want to talk about this evening. And, about, and I'll, of course, I'm going to show you that science doesn't confirm the billions of years or the Big Bang or uh, millions of years of evolution. It confirms biblical creation. God really does know how to communicate. And he means what he says in Genesis. Wow, you haven't even told us who you are yet, and you're already making assertions about God. God really does know how to communicate? Even if we assume that he wrote the Bible, that's evidence to the contrary, as it's poorly written, contradicts itself many times, it has no way to stop someone from modifying it for their own personal gain, which there is evidence to show that that has happened many times. And it has failed every test of its extraordinary claims that I am aware of. As for God meaning what he says, in the book of Genesis alone, he waffles more than a guy trying to buy a big screen TV and lies at several points. I, uh, I got my PhD at the University of Colorado in Boulder, and where I got it, it, my PhD in astrophysics there. A PhD in astrophysics. Nice. Very interesting subject. I wonder how often it will come into play during your presentation. Also, earlier in the video, there was this guy that I cut out who introduced you as the Director of Research at the Institute for Creation Research. So let's take a look at their website and see how they do research. The Institute for Creation Research is unique among scientific research organizations. Our research is conducted within the biblical worldview, since ICR is committed to absolute authority of the inerrant word of God. The real facts of science will always agree with biblical revelation because the God who made the world of God inspired the word of God. In other words, doctor, you are contractually obligated to believe every word of the Bible is true and dismiss all evidence to the contrary. Now, as we can see from this page that I am scrolling, the Bible clearly states that the earth is flat, is some sort of quadrilateral, sits atop pillars, is covered by a crystal firmament, and never moves in space. I just want everyone to take a moment and let that sink in. You, doctor, are contractually obligated to reject everything you learned to get your PhD and believe that the earth is flat. And I had the opportunity to talk with a lot of brilliant people, no doubt about that. Most of them believed in evolution, and that sort of surprised me because, well, it didn't surprise me, but it perplexed me because there's all this evidence for creation. I'm going to share this with you this evening. Remember that, folks. He said he's going to share with us evidence for creation. And, and I'm sure they were perplexed, too, because they're looking at me and thinking, well, you know, and not all of them knew I was a creationist. I didn't let on too much about that. But th some of them did, and they, I, I'm sure they thought, well, that's kind of odd, because certainly he's aware of all this evidence, right? Um, so how is it that different people can, can look at the same universe and come to very different conclusions about how it came to be? That's what happens when one or more sides of an argument use their feelings as evidence, which is why science does not count feelings as evidence. And I want to suggest to you that's because we have a different way of looking at things. We have a different worldview, and all of us have this worldview like a mental... 
Hold it, this picture you have shown us is interesting. What I find interesting about it is this guy on the right isn't a creationist. Assuming he is Christian, he would be a moderate. How can I tell? By his Bible. Or more specifically, the fact that he was willing to cut a hole in it so that he could see the world through it. And he even put it on a stick to make it easier to hold. I mean, when Moses comes down from the mountain and sees what this guy did to the golden calf everyone has been worshipping, he's going to be pissed, right? Anyway, creationists do not use the Bible to let them see the world. They use the Bible to blind themselves from it. Mental lens that we view the world and through which we view the world. And of course, I'm looking at the universe through the lens of scripture because God gives us the correct view of history. How do you know that God gave you the correct view of history or that he was even involved at all? And so it's like a corrective lens that, that makes things snap into focus. My secular colleagues look at exactly the same data, exactly the same evidence I look at, and they draw very different conclusions because they have a different way of thinking, a different worldview. They're thinking in terms of naturalism, that, that natural law and of course, I believe in natural laws. I think God's responsible for natural laws. We have a lawgiver, that's why we have natural laws. No, humans made the laws. They are descriptive of what we observe, not rules the universe follows. They weren't handed down to us from some invisible sky daddy. Now, since you were kind enough to blow up that image for us to get a good look at, let's talk about it for a moment. Suffering, extinction, killing, disease, pain, struggle, death, life from non-life. And I'm going to guess that they're all over millions of years. This makes me think that not only are you building a straw man here by showing that this is what science is about, but you're also trying to emotionally charge the issue by making people think that anyone who believes in science also thinks that these are good things, and are therefore bad people. Now the odd part about this is the Bible does say those are good things. For example, the book of Job. In this story, God kills off poor Job's family and animals. He gave Job terrible diseases that filled his every waking moment with pain and suffering. And throughout all of this, Job was forced to struggle to survive and make ends meet somehow. The only thing on this list God doesn't do in the book of Job is extinction. But he does plenty of that elsewhere in the Bible. And it's always good because God is good and God can do no evil. But my secular colleagues take that to an extreme and they think everything, even the origin of the universe, is explicable by natural laws. Those bastards! How dare they think that science can only deal with things we can see and interact with here in the real world. And so they tend to think in terms of millions of years of death, suffering, and so on, producing life on Earth. I'm looking at the same universe through biblical glasses. Bible glasses are a fancy way to say blindfold. Anyway, let's have a look at the slide here. We once again have our moderate pretending to be a creationist, and he has a weird list here. The seven seas of history, creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion, Christ, crossed, and what I'm guessing is consummation. Five of those things seem fairly straightforward, but what is confusion? I mean other than the state this list has left me in. As for consummation, I only have one thing I can think of as to what that might be, but Christ is already a bit higher up on that list. I find that it makes a lot of sense when you understand the Bible's version of history, the true version of history. The Bible is the true version of history? That's so demonstrably false, that's not even funny. For example, let's look at some of the reasons why the Roman census that required Mary to give birth to Jesus in Bethlehem didn't actually happen. First of all, that Roman census was for taxes. But Romans never used census data for taxes. In fact, the Romans usually didn't collect their own taxes. Instead, they would contract out the tax to private organizations that would then figure out who and how much people needed to pay. The second reason is both Luke and Matthew say that it took place while Herod was king of Judea and when Quirinius was the governor. But while King Herod was alive, his kingdom was separate from Rome and only paid Romans tribute. So while Herod was alive, Rome had no authority to tax or call for a census of the people of Judea. Furthermore, only one census had ever been done while Quirinius was governor. It happened about 10 years after King Herod died, and it only affected Judea and not Galilee. So Mary wouldn't have had to travel. The next reason is that any census that was conducted would only have required Mary's husband, Joseph, to be present, and no sane man would risk the health and well-being of his wife and child by dragging them on a 90-mile hike during the last days of pregnancy. 
And the last reason I'm going to cover is Rome, one of the most efficient empires on Earth, would never have required the mass migration of millions of people over 100 miles to fill out a tax form. Beginning with a perfect world that God created, and then it became ruined because of Adam's sin. Adam and Eve had no free will before they took a bite from the fruit of knowledge, and could not have chosen either to or not to eat that fruit. So up until the moment they took that bite, every decision they had faced had already been made for them by God, which would mean that God wanted Adam and Eve to corrupt his perfect world. This is further evidenced by the fact that there was even a tree of knowledge there in the first place. If God absolutely had to have a tree of knowledge, he could have put it on the moon, and nobody would have been able to eat from it. And so on, you can see the major uh, points in biblical history listed there. And it's because of what Adam did that we need a savior. And so Again, Adam could not have made the choice, and so could not have sinned. So it really is important, even in explaining the gospel message, that we tie it back into a literal genesis, an historical genesis. So I want to cover briefly three different fields of science tonight that often come up in origins debates. Fields of genetics, which is how traits are passed on from one organism to the next. We'll deal a little bit with information theory, which maybe you've never heard of that, but it's really interesting and it really confirms uh, biblical creation. And then we'll talk about geology, earth science, things like rocks and even fossils, paleontology, that sort of thing. Genetics, information theory, and geology. I can't help but notice that none of these things have anything to do with astrophysics. And so we're going to start with genetics, which is the study of how traits are passed on from one organism to the next. And so my first question then is, do animals change? Do dogs change? Do dogs change? Yeah, dogs change. What do they change into? Dogs. dogs. Okay, very good. Yeah, see? Which is exactly what the theory of evolution tells us. Dogs will only ever give birth to other dogs, and their lineage will never stop being dogs, just as they will never stop being mammals or vertebrates. In fact, if you could ever find a dog that gave birth to something that is not a dog, like the fabled crocoduck, for instance, you would have successfully proven evolution faults and would have both fame and riches awaiting you. That's not a problem. And that, now that's not evolution, is it? That's, you know, dogs changing into their... I mean, you can get lots of different breeds of dogs today. We, we know that. And you can, by selectively breeding them, you can get different breeds and so on. Now, that's not evolution because, you know, they started with dogs. They're dogs now. They'll always be dogs. That's not evolution. That's just dogs, right? Again, this is exactly what evolution states we can expect to find. That's not a problem. And that's what we'd expect given what the Bible teaches in Genesis because the Bible indicates that God created animals according to their kinds. Please identify exactly what a kind is for us. Until you do, scientists can't use it because it has a wishy-washy definition that means whatever you want it to mean in the moment. And that's a phrase that's used... Uh, Ten times in Genesis 1, after its kind or after their kind, used of uh, the various organisms that God created. He must be serious about that. There's something to this kind concept. That's great. Now can you please tell us what a kind is? And apparently that represents the reproductive limit of an organism. Wow, did you actually just give us a testable definition for the word kind? I admit I'm actually a little taken aback by that. I honestly didn't expect it. So now that we have a testable definition, which I think is that any two animals that can breed together are of the same kind, let's test it out. On the west coast of the United States, there are some salamanders whose names I'm probably going to butcher horribly, but we'll give it a shot anyway. We'll start out with Kelavuri, which can breed with Cochreter, so they must be of the same kind. Cochreter can breed with Plantensis, so those three must be of the same kind. Plantensis can breed with Orgensis, so they must be of the same kind. Orgensis can breed with Picta, Picta can breed with Xenthopica, and Xenthopica can breed with Echtolstolzi, which means they must also be of the same kind. But Echtolstolzi cannot breed with Kelivuri, which means they must be of different kinds. This phenomena is known in science as a ring species, and causes the testable definition you have given us to fail its test. Because... When God brought the animals to the ark, Noah's ark, it brought two of each kind. What the? Did you just misquote your own holy book? Well, let's go to our King James Bible and turn to Genesis chapter 7, verse 2 and 3. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female. That's odd. It says seven, which means you end up with messed up breeding pairs. Unless it actually means seven pairs and not seven animals. 
and of the beasts that are not clean, by two, the male and his female. Of fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep the seed alive upon the face of all the earth. So that would give us fourteen of every animal that is either clean or flies, and four of every other animal. Also, now that I'm looking at it, I can't help but to notice the word kind was never used. Isn't that odd? To preserve their kind, and so that's the reproductive limit. It doesn't say animals will reproduce exact clones of themselves. No, God has built into organisms the ability to change a bit. There's, there's a, a certain amount of variety built into it. And that's not evolution, though, because they remain the same kind, and they always have and they always will be. Yes, that is actually evolution, and we've already demonstrated that your definition of kind has failed its test. So please stop using it. This is a place, by the way, where evolutionists sometimes misrepresent what it is that creationists teach. They'll say, well, you know, that, that, uh, you know, that creationists believe that God made every species back at creation uh, the same as they are today. And that's not true. First of all, the Bible doesn't mention the word species. That's a modern word. It's a man-made classification system. Yes, as previously mentioned, scientists use the word species instead of the word kind. Because the definition of kind as used by creationists is usually wishy-washy and means whatever you want it to in the moment, and while you were actually brave enough to give us a testable definition, scientists still can't use it because your definition failed its test. The Bible uses the word kind, uh, created kind, bara men in the Hebrew, and it's not exactly the same as a species, right? Because, for example, if you look at this, this chart up here, this misrepresentation, that's, that's not accurate because it doesn't show any change at all. And we do think th things have changed since creation, right? I don't believe that God created poodles in the Garden of Eden. Let's look at this chart for a moment. The vertical axis, I'm guessing, is time, since it's got an arrow going from creation to today. The horizontal axis is labeled morphology. The center part has some bars in it that are a slightly different color than its border, and some of those bars don't go all the way to the top. Is this some kind of bar graph? I have absolutely no idea what this is trying to show us. Right? Because it was a paradise. It was a very good world. And you're not going to have <laughs> poodles running around in it. So, they've changed a bit, haven't they, since creation. And so, now, by the way, you can get different species from a common kind. That happens. You know, there's a group of mosquitoes and it goes off and lives in a cave for 100 years and you bring it back out and it's not able to interbreed with its parent population. And so it's classified as a different species, but they're still mosquitoes. Yes, just as evolution states, they will still be mosquitoes. They're still the same kind. Wait, wait, wait. Did you just change your definition of kind on us? Because your previous definition was two animals that could breed together are of the same kind. But here you have two animals that can't breed with each other, but are still of the same kind? How does that work? So that's not a problem. No, that's a huge problem. You have an animal that doesn't fit your definition of kind, but is still somehow of the same kind. Please explain to us how that works. So you see, the true view of what we believe would be more like an orchard than a straight line like that. Oh, okay. Now that I've seen this slide, your previous one makes a whole lot more sense. Those bars were supposed to represent different species. So that means right now you're trying to kick down an already open door and rebut an argument that I've never heard anyone make before. So does that mean this is a straw man? We believe that God created certain kinds of organisms, and they have diversified since creation. There are, different, there are different varieties, but they're all the same basic kinds that were created. And so there's a limited amount of variation, um, and, and we'll see genetically that that's built into organisms to be able to do that. And so, and of course, some of those varieties have gone extinct, and others, um, sometimes a, and a complete kind goes extinct. Sometimes just a certain variety within a kind goes extinct, like mammoths, which are part of the elephant kind. Or they're, they're genuinely related to elephants, they're in the same kind, and yet they're extinct, because those particular genes have been eliminated, as we'll see. Now, in the evolutionary view, the, the kind of diversification that's possible is unlimited. And so you start with something, a single-celled organism, something like bacteria, and then eventually over hundreds of millions of years, billions of years even, it eventually becomes all the different kinds of life on Earth. And so you're related biologically to broccoli in the evolutionary worldview. <laughs> And you're chuckling at that, but that is what evolutionists believe. I'm not making fun of them. That really is what they believe. Now I realize that by making that particular comparison, you're trying to make an argument from incredulity. But except for your liberal use of the word kind, that is correct. Humans and broccoli do have a common ancestor. It was a single-celled organism that lived about 1.6 billion years ago, and was neither plant nor animal. 
And so there really, is, there really aren't such a thing as separate kinds in the evolutionary view. Everything's really this, the same kind. And this is exactly why the scientists do not use the word kind. The definition of it is so wishy-washy that it can literally mean anything you want it to. So literally everything is both of the same kind and of its own kind simultaneously. Right, and so it, the change ought to be unlimited in the evolutionary worldview. No, change is governed by several different mechanisms under evolution that limit what kind of changes can occur. This is why we would never expect to see a dog giving birth to the fabled crocoduck, for example. Now to see how this works scientifically, we need to know a little bit about DNA. That's a very long molecule that exists in the cells of your body. It looks something like a twisted ladder, and on, this, on the rungs of this ladder are these little nucleotide base pairs, and there's four different varieties of those, always indicated by the four letters that you see there, the A, C, T, and, and G. And based on how those letters are arranged, it actually s sort of it, it, it spells out instructions on how to make certain proteins. Uh, it's really rather remarkable. In the same way that you could spell help with Morse code with beads on a rope, uh, likewise, you can spell out all the instructions to make an organism in its DNA. Really remarkable. You could write a book, theoretically, in DNA. No, you couldn't. Don't confuse your simplified analogy for the real thing. DNA has no letters. The letters we use are what we have assigned to it to make it easier to work with. Uh, kind of amazing. And that, in fact, is the mechanism that God used to, to encode the instructions that make you. And your evidence for this assertion is what, exactly? And the reason that you're a person and not a cabbage is you've got instructions for a person, and a cabbage has instructions for a cabbage, and I'm sure you're grateful for that. Um, some, by the way, some of those instructions are the same because we use some of the same proteins that are found in a cabbage, which is why it's useful to eat a cabbage, right, and get nutrients from it. That's very important because, you know, some evolutionists will mock and say, well, you know, if God created all these different organisms, why did he put some of the same DNA patterns in them? Wow. That was such a straw man. Now, interestingly enough, we actually do have an intelligently designed analog to DNA that gives us an idea of what to expect if DNA was intelligently designed. The analog is machine executable code, in other words, a computer program, and it is intelligently designed by a person called a programmer. Over the course of a programmer's career, they often tend to build up a personal library of functions that they often find useful. If we examine a program made by this programmer, we will find some of these functions from their personal library. Now, if we compare this program to another program this person has made, we will again find the same functions from their library. But they will almost never be in the same place or in the same order. Even if we then compare this to another version of the same program, we will again find the same functions, but again, they will rarely be in either the same position or order. There are usually good reasons for this, but to an outside observer, everything might look randomly and arbitrarily placed. Furthermore, every bit of that program does something and is there for a reason. So if DNA was intelligently designed, we would expect to find the same DNA segments being used over and over again in different animals, but they would seem to have been placed randomly. We would even expect in different breeds of the same species would have those chunks of DNA in different places. We would also expect to find that every bit of that DNA was in some way important and did something. But this isn't in fact what we find, now is it? Because if he didn't, the only thing we would be able to eat is each other, and that would be a problem, right? <laughs> Not only is that an appeal to consequences, but your assertion that lets you make it is completely false. We eat stuff that our body needs, but has absolutely no clue how to make all the time. The first such example that I can think of is vitamin C, which is required for the production of collagen, without which your skin would just start to liquefy. It's, it's kind of important that there's some similarities there. You have two different sets of DNA. You get one set from dad, you get one set from mom, and it's the combination of these two sets that determine various traits. A section of the DNA that controls the traits called a gene. And so here it is with blood type, for example. And so if you have, if mom has, uh, well, if, if you have um, type A, you can either have, you know, the A and the A gene together, A from mom, A from dad, or you can have the A and the O because A is dominant and O is recessive, so A covers up the O. Remember, probably remember doing this in, in school. I know that was millions of years ago for some of you, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> a, and, 
or the only way you can get A and B, right, the, by having the combination there, because they're codominant. The only way you can get blood type O is to have the two recessive O alleles, and that's actually very common because the O allele is very common in uh, human DNA. The thing that I find interesting, though, is that from just two parents, you can get a tremendous amount of variety in the children. So, for example, in blood type, if mom has blood type A, and it's the heterozygous A, where the A and the O, and, and dad has blood type B, and it's the heterozygous with the, the O and the B, then the children could have any possible blood type. Isn't that interesting? And you can see how that works out, because they get one gene from one parent and another gene from another parent, apparently randomly, or at least only God knows why, why the ones are selected that they are. We know exactly why that happens, and you would too if you took a basic class in biology. Normally when cells divide, they first make a complete copy of all their genetic information so that both new cells have a complete copy. This is called mitosis. But when a cell becomes a sex cell, like an egg or a sperm, they undergo a process called meiotic division where they will split without copying genetic information. So each new egg or sperm cell produced only has half the genetic information. The sperm cell will then seek out an egg cell to merge with and once again have a complete set of genetic information. And uh, so the children can have, for example, blood type O, even though neither parent has blood type O. I'm sorry, but your own slide shows that both parents have genes for type O blood. But the children can still get that, but they still got the information from their parents. That's what I want to drill home. All the information in your DNA you got from your mom and your dad, but you have a unique combination. And for that reason, you have traits. You might, you might have some traits that neither of your parents have, right? Now, I've got, uh, I've got brown eyes like my mom. My brother has sort of green eyes like my dad. My sister's eyes are blue. Now, what happened there? I used to tell her she was adopted. She didn't believe me for that. No. But uh, no, it's just it's because uh, it's, it was a, or the, um, the blue gene is recessive, and so she happened to get that particular combination. Uh, here it is with uh, skin color. We basically already all have one skin color, brown, caused by a pigment, melanin. It's just a question of how much of this pigment you have. And so if you're up in the, uh, the upper left-hand box there, if you have a lot of melanin, you have all the capital letter representing certain genes there. This is simplified, of course, but the basic uh, principles here are true. If you're in that upper left box and you get married to somebody in that upper left box, your kids are going to be in that upper left box because that's the only combination that's available. Only the capital letters are available. If you're in the lower right-hand box, uh, same thing. You get married to somebody in the lower right-hand box, that's the only combination that's possible. But imagine you're in the upper right-hand box there, the kind of the medium gray. If, if it's the heterozygous combination, big A, little A, big B, little B, and you get married to somebody in that box, Kids can have any, any shade from very, very dark to very, very light. And there are places in the world even today where that happens, certain places in India, for example, where that can happen. We think Adam and Eve probably had a middle brown skin color, right? Because that would account for all the different shades that we uh, see today. And it's the same way with dogs. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about dogs because we can see the tremendous variation that God has built into the dog kind. I have no idea where you're going with this topic of inheritable traits, but I have to stop you right there with your assertion and ask how do you know that God in any way had a hand in the development of dogs. Also, I'll let the Adam and Eve remark go because you prefaced it with, we think. And so, and you can do that by, by having these, this heterozygous genome where you have the big A, little A, big B, little B. In just two dogs, you can build in a tremendous amount of variety. And you can get different breeds of dog much later by the way those genes uh, sort of fall out as a function of time. Now, in the evolutionary view, single-celled microbes, something like bacteria, eventually over millions of years became something like a horse, okay? That's what they believe. Now, if that's true, well, then, I mean, bacteria have some instructions that, that form their structure and make their proteins, and a horse has certain instructions that make its structure and make its form. A horse has a lot more instructions than bacteria because it's a more complicated critter. And so if bacteria become horses, then information has to get increased, right, in the, in the genome. You have, to in, you have to somehow add brand new instructions to the DNA of these organisms because bacteria do not have instructions to make eyes or legs or a tail or bones. A horse does have those instructions, right? So if, if I mean, if horses evolved from bacteria, at some point in, new instructions, brand new instructions had to be added to the DNA of the bacteria. Right, and this happens because of mutation. Mutations will build up over time, greatly changing the organism. Now, a mutation can be good, it can be bad, or it can just be benign. 
Bad ones get weeded out during the process called natural selection, leaving only good and benign mutations to build up. Furthermore, these mutations can add information, remove information, or just change already existing information. It has to be the case. It's not just that the horse has more DNA, though it does, but it has more, in, it has more information content in its DNA. It's got instructions that the bacteria lacks. And so it seems to me that unless information increases, you can't have molecules to man evolution. You can't have it, right? Because you've got to increase the instructions somehow. Now, I'm not sure what you mean by molecules to man evolution, but I think you're trying to include abiogenesis into evolution, which is wrong because evolution does not deal with how life began, only what happened to life after it was already here on this planet. As for increasing the instructions, that is one of the things that mutation does, as previously mentioned. So the kinds of changes that I, as a creationist, would expect would be the kinds that, are, that God has built in, the, based on the information God's built into the genome, whereas the evolutionists would expect brand new instructions to be added, uh, and the information has to increase in order for evolution to be true. Which it does. So evolution must be true by your own logic. And by the way, that's not the only thing that would be required to make evolution work. I think there are some other problems with it in terms of irreducible complexity. There is no such thing as irreducible complexity. It has been repeatedly debunked time and time again. And since I don't think you're going to go into it, and I don't really feel like going into it, I'll leave a link in my list of citations in case you're interested in actually learning about it. And things like that. But at the very least, if you don't have an increase in information, you don't have evolution. That's true. So it's a good thing we have mutation. Right, because that's required. It has to be. And that's very interesting because the kinds of processes we observe in nature scientifically are in the opposite direction of evolution. They reduce information or are perhaps neutral, but they don't increase it. They don't add brand new instructions to the DNA. There's no way to sugarcoat it. That's a straight up lie. We have seen it happen both in the lab and in the wild many times. One such example is a bacteria discovered in Japan that is capable of digesting nylon. Now, I picked up this particular example because in order to dismiss it, creationists have to lie about it and say that bacteria have always had the ability to digest this man-made material, even though it has been proven that the genetic sequence that allows them to do so does not even exist in the ancestors of this strain of bacteria. And I think we'll end part one here.